180,000. That was the number of people wiped out during Ainz's massacre. Out of all 260,000 troops who showed up to the battlefield, there was less than 80,000 that ended up making it back. So, for a kingdom that once boasted such a powerful military, you can only imagine what a crippling blow like that would do to its society. Especially when you consider that many of the casualties were nobles as well. So, as an episode that focuses on the kingdom's recovery, you can expect a lot of scheming due to the chaotic nature of this rebuilding phase. Like, with the whole of noble society being practically uprooted, there's a lot of room for newcomers to make their own impact. And that's exactly what we're going to look at here. There's Princess Renner's fairly secretive ambitions, Philip's obvious grasp for power, then Albedo's ploy to take over, well, everything. Those are the core things that we'll focus on this episode. But first, do you like isekai and the waifus within them? Well, do I have the perfect mobile game for you? With today's sponsor, Refantasia Charm and Conquer, you too can make your harem in this gorgeous yet simple city builder. After starting a new life in this medieval world of fantasy, you'll assemble a team to manage your kingdom, level them up to inspire and recruit more followers, then take on surrounding nations using that influence. What makes Refantasia so particularly interesting though is the seemingly limitless number of well-designed waifus to create consorts out of. Like, I'm talking some high quality art on all sorts of fantastical creatures. So, with literally every type of waifu available to romantically encounter, it's super easy to create as many love stories as you want with them. Then, once you produce some heirs with whatever harem you've created, you can then use them to foster alliances with other nations, resulting in this intricate web of marriages that help make your kingdom even stronger. And that's only one of the many strategic aspects that has you manage resources to generate power and extend your conquest. So, if you're interested in exploring this harem-focused world of fantasy, then feel free to use the link in the description or my QR code to download it today. Not only is it completely free, but it's also a great way to support the channel. Plus, you can use my code for special rewards. But now, let's get back to the video. Episode 41, The Reestes Kingdom. Covering Chapter 2 from Volume 10 of the Light Novel. Since much of the prologue was stuff that I talked about at the end of last video, we can skip ahead to when Princess Renner is already in the carriage. A scene mostly faithful to how it went in the novels, but slightly rushed to the point that it might have been a bit confusing. When Evil Eye had said that it was only natural for the weak to die, she wasn't talking about the hundreds of thousands that died at war, but instead the orphans that Renner had built the orphanage for. She couldn't understand why Renner would support people who were likely to end up dying anyway. Then, when Renner began to explain why she did, her approach of the strong saving the weak had reminded Clime of his past. It made him think that perhaps these orphanages were being built because of him. Perhaps because she knew what Clime's life was like back then, she wanted to make sure that no one else ended up like him. Clime couldn't know for sure that this was her reasoning, but he did feel pretty confident that that's what it was. Now, the reason Tina found the princess's method so clever was because the orphanages were actually the optimal way of keeping track of everyone. You see, by gathering all those who were most likely to fall into crime, it was much easier to ensure that they didn't. The orphanages pretty much prevented evil before it could even take root, not only making the capital much safer for everyone, but also providing a place for Brain to scout for the next Gossip. Of course, Renner hoped that more skilled people would show up to scout for talent as well, but as a princess so far removed from the noble lineage, the money it would cost to do that wasn't something readily available to her. Like, it wasn't free to hire adventurers to show up like this, and getting them to teach other people techniques certainly wasn't something they'd do for free either. Just the talk of having skills being passed around for free already started rubbing Tina the wrong way here. As for when it came to scouting them, watching their movements for aptitude was one thing, but determining their affinity for magic was completely different. Even with Evil Eye's superior sense for magical ability, it'd still be difficult to gauge since magic was more internal than external. If we're just scouting for talents though, detecting one of those was much, much easier. There were various types of magic that could tell if someone possessed a talent or not, some even specifying what that talent was. Once that talent was detected though, it was getting the person possessing it to express it that was the hard part. Figuring out how to use that talent was a whole separate issue, especially when the talent could just be something trivial. When Evil Eye began to talk about Momo next, we find out the only thing stopping her from going to him was the commands of her leader. You see, until Gagarin and Tia were back to full strength, Evil Eye was forbidden from making the trip to him. Even if she could just fly there and teleport back, Tina would be sure to let Lacius know. 
So, as much as Evil Eye wanted to know why Momon sided with Ainz, she wouldn't be allowed to ask until things were safer. Now, once Renner was back at the castle, her brother Zanak had rushed to see her to discuss an urgent matter. But before we get to that, he had first given us a rather interesting opinion on Climb. As Renner's personal hand-picked knight, Zanak knew that her choice of him was a special one. There had to be a reason someone so intelligent picked someone so seemingly mediocre. Well, after his survival of both Yaldaboth and the Sorcerer King, Zanuck had come to the conclusion that very few soldiers in the capital were stronger than him. Even among Gazev's hand-picked selection of knights, Zanuck believed few to be superior or even equal to him. So, combine his strength with Renner's connections to Brain and Lachius, and Zanuck was starting to think that his sister might be planning a coup. I mean, with such a strong selection of warriors at her side, Renner had by far the strongest force out of anyone in the capital. So, that being the case, it was only natural for him to start making alliances with his own adventurers. They may not be the coveted adamantite level, but a few mithrils and orichalcums would certainly be helpful. Now, with regards to his current predicament, too much time was passing without any action being taken. Zanuck was currently unsure as to how to approach the Ein situation. That being the case, his best bet right now was to rely on his sister. Surely someone as clever as her would know how to approach this. So, with the main concern being how not to look submissive to the nobles, Renner's idea to give double the gift was practically perfect. You see, because the reward was simply for the Sorcerer Kingdom coming to see them, it wouldn't appear as if it was him making the first move. Instead, it would simply seem like common courtesy. So, with Renner having solved Zanuck's problem, Zanuck was more than happy to reward her by offering some remote land somewhere. It was the least he felt he could do considering how helpful she'd been. But just like how we saw in the anime, an offer like that wasn't appealing at all. No, not only that, but apparently the offer had come a bit too late as well. Apparently Renner had already been reached out to with something better. Fast forward to when Zanuck was greeting Albedo, and that's when he started to realize just how useful Marquis Raven was. You see, as a man who had taken an interest in adventurers, the Marquis was one of the few who had shared in their knowledge. Unlike any other noble who had come before him, he had actually put together a compendium, an enormous collection of knowledge covering all sorts of different monsters and magic. And considering that these were the very two things Zanuck was up against now, he couldn't help but miss the information the Marquis had run away with. Now, when Zanuck went to personally meet Albedo himself, the beauty he saw was completely opposite to the monster he was expecting. In fact, in comparison to Renner who he previously thought to be peerless, Albedo was by far the more bewitching one. What the anime doesn't quite show us after this though is the problem Zanuck was immediately confronted with. You see, there was a very specific issue that came with Albedo possessing one name only. When it came to nobility in the kingdom and empire, the number of names you possessed dictated how important you were. The common folk only had two, the nobles had three to four, then the royal family were the select few with four to five. That's how the nobles typically determined what standing you were. So, for someone like Albedo to show up with one name only, Zanuck was worried the nobles might make a big deal out of it. I mean, they had even gone so far as to question Jerkniv's nobility. Since he only possessed four names instead of five, many of the kingdom's nobility didn't believe he was worthy to rule the empire. Now, part of what made the whole nobility problem worse was the fact that many of the competent ones were lost in the war. There were very few people left who Zanuck had high hopes for. Plus, with many of the new nobles lacking a formal education, the factions formed around them weren't really the smartest either. It was very unlikely they even knew how to interact in political situations like this. That being the case, Zanuck couldn't be sure that they'd treat Albedo with the respect she deserved. Thus, the reason for him asking this next question. Ideally, he would have liked to ask what her title was directly, but that was a question that made him seem far too ignorant. The most he could get away with right now was a simple inquiry into her position. That way, he could at least have something to compare to, then go back and explain that to the other nobles. When Albedo responded with the captain of the Floor Guardians, though, Zanuck had no idea what she meant by that. The only thing he got was that she was close enough to the king to call him Eines, a position that could be anything from a duchess to a marquis perhaps even Prime Minister. Now, the last thing that happened during this meeting was a series of apologies for Albedo's non-extravagant greeting, then an interesting request by Albedo to go sightseeing. The reason they couldn't greet Albedo like how they did every other guest was because the kingdom didn't want the public to know that they were coming. 
It was a natural response considering how many of their people they killed. Then, there wasn't any explained reason for Albedo's sightseeing request, but she did seem quite interested in exploring the area a bit. So, in addition to banquets, concerts, and cocktail parties, Albedo would also take part in diplomatic negotiations and sightseeing. That was the schedule the kingdom had planned out for her. Moving on to the banquet now, I'm sure plenty of you are interested in this new character, Philip. Well, as the third son from a not-so-wealthy family, his position as a spare was certainly a less than desirable one. Had he not been hit with several significant strokes of luck, then it's more than likely the rest of his life would have been spent as a farmer. So, where his life began to turn around was the time when his second brother got sick and died. No longer was he the spare of the spare, but instead next in line behind his first brother now. He could see his life improving from a farmer to a butler now. Where Philip began to consider himself the luckiest in the world, though, was when his first brother went to war and didn't come back. The perfect safe war his brother went off to improve his reputation in instead left him caught up in Ainz's massacre. So, with no one left to stand in his way, Philip was now sure to inherit everything. It was a level of timing so convenient that Philip actually thought the Sorcerer King had done it for him, resulting in this false sense of closeness to an entity he'd never met before. Now, for a majority of Philip's life, he always saw a better way for his family to make money, but never acted on it since he knew that money would never end up coming his way. Now that he was in charge, though, he was extremely eager to show everyone just how fit he was for the position he lucked into. He had a massive pipeline of ideas guaranteed to make himself and his domain wealthier. Initially, those ideas didn't include Albedo, but after seeing just how out of place she looked during the banquet, Philip knew he had to be the first one to talk to her. Since now would likely be the only time she'd be alone, this was the only chance he'd get to seize the opportunity. I mean, it wasn't often that Albedo looked so unsure as to what to do with herself. So, as he counted on his luck to carry him once again, Philip made the move that everyone else was far too scared to, bringing us to the heated conversation with his father after. While much of this was pretty much the same, the key takeaway from it was Philip's naive assumption that he was in control. You see, Philip was treating the whole thing like it was just a massive nation-scale board game. If everyone else was just a piece on the board, then that meant both Ainz and Albedo were pawns to him. Sure, he did feel an affinity towards Ainz for helping him out, but more than anything this Sorcerer King was just a pawn to enrich his own position. That was the current mindset Philip had about this. One thing Philip's father did want to make sure of, though, was that even with everything that had happened, he needed to know whether Philip thanked the Count after or not. So long as Philip made an effort to have his position formally recognized, then his father still believed their reputation could be salvaged. Of course, Philip believed the very notion to be ridiculous, but even he wasn't so heartless as to tell his father that he didn't. So instead, Philip just lied and said he did. He had made his father think that their family was still respected within the Count's faction of nobility. If we fast forward to the actual banquet now, Philip couldn't help but think that every noble not to greet him first was a complete idiot. Considering how he was the host and the sole reason for the guest of honor, it didn't make sense why no one was giving him the respect he deserved. What made these nobles so inferior, though, was the very thing that made them perfect to be led by him. Sure, many of them were rather new to the nobility scene, but that just meant that they could easily be molded by him. So, with that issue now resolved, the next to cross Philip's mind was a matter of Hilma. He wanted to know why she looked so frail and skinny. Naturally, this wasn't something that Hilma could talk about, so rather than tell him about her exposure to Nazarick, she instead said that it was due to her dietary habits. Hilma had told him that she just couldn't eat any solid food. Philip did inquire as to why, but the moment he did was when Hilma lost her elegance a bit. Just the mere mention of it had drained all her emotion entirely, resulting in Philip to back off a bit. Philip wasn't sure what type of trauma it is she could have gone through, but it was extremely obvious it was something heavy, something that definitely ruined eating for her. Switching over to the perspective of Hilma now, and that's when we get a bit more context on what she meant by calling this a feeding ground. You see, the aftermath of Ainz's massacre left everything a mess. Nobles at the top were now at the bottom, and a whole bunch of new factions were being formed from the remnants. And even if you were a noble who didn't have a faction before, the chaos of now made it your last chance to join one. This was the only time anyone would have the opportunity to realign themselves. So, when a banquet like this comes up, it was the perfect place for the big fish to feed on the little ones. 
any first-class noble would easily monopolize on it and absorb the lesser ones into their own faction. The fact that no one was doing so for the hour that Hilma was watching, though, had made her realize that there were no first-class nobles here. Not a single person was someone that she deemed worthy of working with. Now, after a total of 90 minutes had passed, that's when Hilma was called to begin her real job. The true purpose of the banquet, which I'm sure we'll see more of later. Until then, though, the only thing left to talk about is this final scene. A private moment between two rather unlikely acquaintances. The first thing to note is that this was actually one of the four main reasons for Albedo's trip here. The first was to transport supplies. The second was to create an excuse to start a war. The third to make arrangements for a personal goal. Then the fourth and final was to make a deal with her. Well, not really so much a deal, but instead give a reward for a job well done. You see, Renner was everything Demiurge had led Albedo to believe she was. Not only had she betrayed her blood and family, but there wasn't a single bit of remorse for the fact that she did. It was as if she was completely unbothered by the concepts of good and evil. Yes, she understood exactly what they were, but she had no problem disregarding them the exact same way that Demiurge or Albedo would. So, it's for that very reason that Albedo couldn't consider Renner as a human. She was far too inhuman to even be classified as such. That being the case, Albedo was actually intrigued enough to show concern for her. She was genuinely worried that Renner might not be able to fulfill her goal in time. While all she did have to do was open the box, to actually do so was a challenge of its own. It was a test that, if completed, would grant her everything that she desired. That and a guaranteed position equivalent to that of a Domain Guardian. But yeah, that's pretty much everything from Season 4, Episode 2. If you enjoyed what you saw, then be sure to leave a like and let me know in the comments. Now, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!